we're so grateful to see you all here tonight. We're grateful for your contributions to this sold out event. We have a generous donor, Judith Jill of Seattle, Washington and San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, who is matching all of tonight's donations dollar for dollar. So thank you very much to Judith. And if you still like to contribute or to contribute more, it's not too late. This is a nonprofit venture with an educational purpose and your donations will go toward helping us complete filming and production and what I think will be a really important film and an important contribution to the conversation about immigration. So here's how the evening will go. After introducing our speakers and showing you a short trailer, we'll take you behind the scenes and we'll show you three never before seen clips from the documentary. You'll hear from some key players from our team about what their experience of making this film has been like so far. And then we will open up the floor for Q and A. So please put any questions you may have into the chat box. And I think that's everything I had to say to get us started. So with that, I um, think if we are ready, I'm going to officially start by welcoming um, our three wonderful uh, speakers for today. So welcome to our discussion and a sneak peek of an exciting documentary in progress, Las Abogadas, which is Spanish for the female lawyers, which tells the story of migration at the US-Mexico border from the perspective of a number of intrepid women attorneys who've been defending the rights of migrants at the front lines at the border and beyond. My name is Karen Shannon. I'm the executive producer of Las Abogadas. And I came on board of this project when I learned that my friend, Rebecca Eichler, who's our subject matter expert, um, US immigration attorney who moved to Mexico a few years ago, was one of the films featured Abogadas. She's been doing amazing work, not just at the border, but in the interior um, of Mexico working with migrants mostly from Central America who are trying to make their way through Mexico to seek safety in the United States after fleeing violence, poverty, and persecution in their home countries. I'm a longtime immigration lawyer myself, for those of you who know me, and the idea of telling the story of these migrants through film and showing the uphill battle against all manner of legal barriers that lawyers like Rebecca have to fight really spoke to me. So I decided I wanted to do what I could to ensure that this story gets told. Tonight, you'll get to listen in on a conversation between Rebecca and the documentary's award-winning director, Victoria Bruce. Vicki is a journalist and a filmmaker who has a history of telling difficult stories set in very challenging locations. For example, and these are just a few examples, uh, she wrote a book about hostages held by guerrillas in Colombia. She made a movie about the kidnapping of a presidential candidate in that same country. She's written about the drug war, organized crime, international politics, a volcanic disaster. She's actually a geologist on top of everything else <laughs> um, and so much more. She's made numerous films that have been shown in over 50 film festivals, have been acquired by HBO, CBS, the History Channel, Netflix, Hulu, PBS. Vicki and Rebecca today will talk about what it was like to film heart-wrenching scenes with migrants in Central America and at Mexico's Northern and Southern borders. Joining them will be the real, the one and only, Laura Seltzer Dunai, <laughs> our film's impact producer and one of our cinematographers on the film. Laura is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker and an educational filmmaker who has a special interest in producing stories about migration, the plight of refugees and their efforts to resettle. With her latest Emmy-nominated PBS film, Nobody Wants Us, about Holocaust refugees, she's taken outreach and audience engagement to a new level creating a robust social impact strategy that includes nonprofit, film festival, and university screenings, as well as the development of a middle school curriculum. She plans to use a similar and customized strategy for Las Abogadas, which we also hope to screen in colleges and law schools around the country. So with no further ado, let's start and set the scene by taking a look at a brief trailer. When Trump was elected, we all knew it was going to be bad, but we had no idea how bad it would get, and we had no idea how quickly it would get so bad. We don't know if they're murderers, if they're killers, if they're MS-13, we're throwing them out by the hundreds. Trump was describing them as invaders, and, and he was sending the National Guard to the border. I have ordered 
another 3,750 troops. I mean, the first group of caravan people, there was like 5,000 migrants in the first caravan, and there was four of us lawyers, and we were telling them what we could. You can't be surrounded by all that misery and pain. When the Trump administration announced its policy of zero tolerance, the United States will not be a migrant camp. And that week, um, family separation had exploded. The, the trauma that went through those kids and those parents is, is something that will never be erased. People that I wanted to reach out the most and be able to assist were African migrants or black migrants coming into Mexico and not being able to have any type of assistance. All they wanted was safety and security and refuge, and they believed that the United States was a country that would provide them that. Okay, all right, okay, let's go. So we got called back. So uh, la otra abogada me dijo para traerla. We were denied again, which is just ridiculous. It just doesn't make any sense. They have a blind person who's in the system, and they don't feel like they have to follow the law. Their own law. President Biden on defense this morning, with the migrant surge growing at the southern border. They don't know what's happening down here. A lot of women told us that in the night, the guys try to open the tents to rape them. I'm afraid that nobody's really giving legal advice to them. They just know they're waiting, but they don't know what they're waiting for. A 20-year-old girl um, whose mom was in the northern part of Mexico, and the girl came to find the mom to reunite with the mom, and she suffered an accident falling off the train. <laughs> Migration shouldn't end. Why should it? The human beings have migrated since the dawn of humanity. This is our basic human right. Wow. So, Vicki, let me start with you. Why did you want to make this film? Um, it's very intense every time I watch that. And I also want to apologize that that was not the subtitled version. Um, everything we do, we make accessible. So um, we have tonight, we just had this non-subtitle version up. So I apologize to anybody um, for not having the subtitles there. Corrine, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting tonight. Corrine describes herself as the executive producer, but to me, she's my abogada in shining armor. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I had sworn off ever making a film again, ever. I had made four films and I was so tired of how hard it is to make a film, to make a film about advocacy, as you described my other work. Um, I, the, the components that go, the years that go by, the people that come and go, but most of all the financing. So Corrine coming on board to executive produce this film has just been game changing. Um, when I first um, I came back to film because I was invited to a film festival to be a jury member um, in Bosnia. And when I arrived, I had already decided I'll never make a film again. And I arrived and everybody there was making these amazing advocacy films. They were doing, you know, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, LGBTQ issues, um, a woman who is um, a devout Muslim who runs. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, and people would say, Vicki, what are you working on? You know, what's, what's your next film? And I'd say, I'm, I'm retired. I'm just, uh, yeah, doing something. Blah, blah. And um, finally, at the, the day we're deliberating, all of this good mojo was getting into my skin. And I was sitting there waiting, thinking with the other jurors about what to, who to award the film to. And all of a sudden a lightning bolt came and hit me and said, I have to make a film about Rebecca Eichler. 
And I had heard of Rebecca Eichler because another one of our team members, Kristen Schrecker, who's watching and is our supervising producer, she it's Rebecca is her best friend. So I had the pleasure of watching this woman do this amazing work in immigration. And the best story that I'd ever heard was, you know, Rebecca by herself and then with a couple other lawyers with her went out to meet a caravan of 5,000 migrants. And she went there with her Volkswagen bus and she filled it up and made a legal clinic in the middle of nowhere, Mexico to help migrants figure out kind of the road they were going down and what they could expect at the border. So I literally from the table there, I was texting Rebecca, I said, let's take a meeting when I get back into town. And um, fortunately for me, Rebecca can't say no to a good time and agreed to be in this film. That's amazing. And, and you know, as I mentioned at the outset, my uh, friendship with Rebecca is what got me uh, interested and involved in this uh, venture as well. Now, I think you have another clip that shows Rebecca a little bit behind the scenes in uh, a migrant shelter in central Mexico near where she lives. Can you pull that up? I can. And this is one of these behind the scenes sneak peeks that we promised you. So this is some new footage that no one's seen, and um, this is not uh, edited together too much. It's just a little like a snippet of kind of watching Rebecca work in the field and how we work as cinematographers. Um, Laura Seltzer Dunai, she shot this footage, and uh, along with Brian Litt, our director of photography. And it's just, you know, making a documentary is about taking an intimate portrait into somebody's life and their work. So here's just a day in the life. Today I'm headed to Albergue Abba, which is a migrant shelter in Celaya, about an hour from my house here in San Miguel. Um, I work intermittently with Abba. I, they consult me on um, like legal aspects of cases that they have a complicated issue, if they have more vulnerable people sometimes. Um, and they just have some questions about immigration things. Pero ellos no van a grabar sin su permiso. Tiene, y no, no quiere hacer ningún presión para grabar. Si no quiere... So I just want to stop this really quick and say what Rebecca is doing here because we haven't had time to put subtitles. And she is explaining to the migrants that we'll be filming and that we're making a film that will be seen in about a, a year, year and a half. And if anybody feels uncomfortable being in the film, that to, to make sure they're, you know, they're not in the scene to let us know. And that's something that we can talk about and why that's very important. So I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit. And that's what she's describing to, to the migrants. And they gave a show of hands that they, they really wanted to talk. They wanted to tell their stories. Pero si está bien, es, dime y voy a permitir de entrar uh, el equipo. Porque mi madre está muy señora, ya tiene 69 años. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Sí. Y vas a quedar aquí por la recuperación. Por la corota, sí. uh -huh. ¿Y cuánto tiempo demora eso más o menos, crees? Uh -huh. pues, pues no sabemos, porque ahorita le volvieron a hacer otra operación. Uh -huh. Y se tiene que recuperar porque ahorita para volver a entrar. Uh -huh. Pero ahorita está bien. Sí, duele mucho. Sí. Lo siento. ¿Y cuándo pasó? ¿Cuándo tuvo su, tu accidente? El 18 de noviembre. Es difícil. Y porque tengo una niña de 18 años. Y cuando la mamá me dijo, la niña cayó del tren cuando estaba buscando a su mamá, cuando estaba tratando de reunirse con su mamá en la parte del norte de México. Y cuando la mamá me dijo, la niña cayó del tren cuando estaba buscando a su mamá en la parte del norte de And it's hard, that's when I broke down because when we can see ourselves reflected in the people that we're talking to, it hits really close to home. And whenever I let myself think about what a mom is doing and what children are doing to be with their parents and what parents are doing to stay with their kids, it's, it hits the hardest. So yeah, that's always difficult to see. I mean, the girl had a beautiful smile and seems to have a good attitude. She said she's in pain, but I think it's you know it's, it's the hardest when when I 
put myself in their place, and I do that really easily, so I have to kind of put a, not let my brain go there, um, because then I would just sit there crying with the people, and that's not helpful to anybody. So I've uh, been to that shelter with you, uh, Rebecca, Abba House, although I wasn't there on that particular day. Can you tell us a little bit about that shelter and, and the pastor that runs it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> that shelter is called Albergue Abba, um, and the pastor who runs it is uh, pretty much a saint of a man named Ignacio Martinez Ramirez. He started the shelter about five years ago and in that time has served tens of thousands, and I wish I knew off the top of my head how many he has served. Um, but he's the, where we are located in central Mexico is really in the middle of the country at a, at an important crossroads of the train journey, um, that many people, uh, use, or they, they ride on the trains. There's a, a cargo train in Mexico. There's no passenger trains. And that's the, that's a primary mode of transport for migrants as they make their way from the Southern um, part of Mexico to the northern part and he's strategically placed right at the crossroads where people have to the tr there are two lines of trains that cross and they have to decide where they're going to go from here if they're going to go um, east towards texas or um, west towards california and um, there's a lot of migrants transitory migrants who are there and they have some time to you know think about what it's a, it's a great place for people to talk to them um, to help them prepare for their arrival at the border, um, how to think about their case. Um, we orient people to, you know, what what to expect once they once they get there. I remember one time talking to people and using these lawyerly words like, you know, when, when you get to the border, um, you'll be put into proceedings and you'll be detained. And as I was talking to them, I realized they had no idea what I was talking about. And I realized I had to to put it into um, layman's terms, which is when you get to the U.S. border, you will be arrested and treated like a criminal. Um, and the looks on their faces was really was was hard to see because that's not what they expected when you know they're fleeing dangers in their home countries and they expect to be welcomed and offered protection in the U.S. And when all I can tell them is that they're going to be treated like a criminal, that's that's really hard to do. Um, so that yeah, and then, and you said in that clip a bit about how it felt for you to see that girl who had lost her legs. But I mean, as a lawyer, how do you how do you cope with those kinds of stories and seeing people that have been through experiences like that? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's hard. I think advocates, especially advocates doing this type of trauma work really have to be very cognizant about taking care of ourselves and recognizing the signs of secondary trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, I, I try to do that as much as I can. And I do that really by limiting the amount of work that I do because it is really very traumatic. Um, and it's also, I kind of have to put up a barrier um, between when I talk to them and, and you know, I, we talked about how difficult it was to film that the girl who had the double amputation, um, but I've, I've been to that shelter enough that I almost don't see it um, and I don't think about it. But at the same time, I know that when I really don't think about it and when I really don't let it affect me is the time that I'll have to, I should probably stop doing this work because, you know, the, the ability to care is what motivates all of us advocates to do this. Um, but it's also our kryptonite because we sometimes care too much. So, yeah, exactly. Um, we have another clip, Vicki. I think this is from when you and your crew were on the southern border of Mexico and Guatemala. You want to let us know what we're about to see? What we're going to see is uh, we were, I think, you know, earlier in the Biden administration, I guess that's just earlier this year, um, there was a lot of um, sort of communicating to the Mexican government to stop the flow of migrants. And so the Mexicans uh, made, Mexican government made a push to sort of trap everyone in Southern Mexico that was coming through from Guatemala. So uh, that's really one of the places where a lot of migrant camps are coming, a lot of deportations are happening. Um, and so we thought that it was important to go witness what was happening there. And Rebecca was actually working down there with um, a nonprofit group and some other attorneys. Um, one was Charlene de Cruz, who's also in the film and one of our abogadas. 
Um, and so this footage was shot by our director of photography, Brian Litt, as well as Laura Seltzer Dunai, who's our producer and one of the cinematographers in the film as well. So I'm just gonna give you a couple scenes from there and sort of talk over the footage. So this is actually a river that divides uh, the, the southern point of Mexico and Guatemala. So that is the entirety at this point of the border is this very narrow river. Um, at this point, it's, it kind of gets rapids and, and kind of turbid waters. But you can see the bridge that you're looking at here, the stone bridge is the actual border. So above, people are crossing the legal and slow way. And below, right below the actual legal bridge, the, where people do legal migration from, from Guatemala to, um, to Mexico, people just use the river. And so they're moving. Now, a lot of people on these rafts are actually day laborers coming from Guatemala. Sometimes people go shopping back and forth. And then there are also migrants. And you, the difference would be sometimes you see guys with a backpack like this only carrying that. Um, and you can kind of identify some migrants, some, some just using the river and they, they pay a small amount of money, they get pulled across the river. And this, the, t the whole time we were there, this goes on all day nonstop. I mean, it's just one raft full after another. This is one of the, the guys who runs the raft. He appears to be about 13 years old. Um, and that's a heavy raft of a lot of people. You can see people of all ages. Um, they're sometimes people moving their kids. And they come across at this point, this is called Talisman. And it's just sort of at the foot of the mountains. It becomes very much more like Central America. Okay, this scene here is once, um, because there are so many people and they're sort of bottlenecked and held in this, um, the state of Chiapas, this is the city of Tap Tapachula. It's, it's a big city and it's just packed with migrants at this point. So every day there are a couple thousand people that line up and these, uh, this is the Mexican immigration authority called Comar and half of it, half of the line is waiting and the Mexican government helps with some subsidies and the other half side of the building, people are lining up to get documents in order to transit through Mexico or to apply for asylum in Mexico. And Rebecca can talk more on that. But the lines were astounding. This is, it's 110 degrees. It's 100% humidity. There's no shade most of the time. You know, people are standing in this tiny bit of shade. And then once they process through there and they have nowhere to go, there are some shelters in town. There are some that um, are newer and nicer that apparent, you know, that we didn't have uh, access to that we weren't, weren't allowed to film. And this is one of the um, shelters that's sort of a nonprofit government hybrid, I believe. And people are stuck in here for months and months, waiting for their papers, waiting to be processed, waiting to go north. Um, the idea for most people is to go to the United States. Um, but, you know, you can tell there's just, there's so many kids, kids everywhere, um, making the best of it as kids always do. And just really delightful, um, but also extremely tragic at the same time. Corinne, you're muted, I think. Sorry, I couldn't get to my unmute button. Uh, Laura, you were one of the cinematographers um, there. I know that your last film was about refugees barely escaping the Nazis in World War II. What was it like for you as a filmmaker to see a, a current mass migration? Yeah, it was really an amazing opportunity. I'm so grateful that Vicky had this vision. I'm so grateful to you know Rebecca, who's doing this good work. Um, and, you know, I'm very fascinated by the plight of migrants and, um, and refugees and the good people that help those in need. That's what I love. And that's what I love about this film is, yeah, I mean, the world sucks, right? I mean, you know, it's a tough world. It's a tough world. Um, there's a lot of bad in the world, but there's also a lot of good in the world. Just like my last film, we featured 
a, a husband and wife law team from my hometown in Virginia, we're featuring these amazing lawyers who are from America making a difference. So it's just really um, gratifying to be able to like, go and document firsthand, get to know these people and hope that we can help make a difference. That's my, what I'm very inspired about is to help use this film to make a difference. And that's why we're excited about talking to you guys because we'll talk more about that as well, how you can also be advocates and use the film to, to do good in the world, create empathy. That's wonderful, Laura, thank you. We have one more clip. And um, speaking of our amazing lawyers making a difference, uh, this one features one of our abogadas, an Ethiopian American attorney based in Los Angeles, who realized, as you saw in the trailer, um, that black migrants in particular, you know, from Haiti or from Haiti, uh, African countries, were also trying to seek asylum in the US via the US-Mexico border. Uh, but many of them didn't speak English or Spanish. And to the extent that there was any help available at all during the last administration, they weren't in a position to even know how to proceed. Um, so Vicki, I think this clip is in Tijuana. Tell us what we're about to see here. Sure, um, I, that was a very important aspect of the film I wanted to cover. And I was introduced to the fact that there were African migrants in at the border of Mexico, which I didn't know uh, from Rebecca. Uh, however, there was really no concerted effort in Matamoros where we first filmed with Rebecca to you know, help people that didn't have any Spanish skills. Um, or people from Africa or you know, Haitians at the time, which um, there weren't as many on that side of the border. So Matamoros is just north uh, or it's just south of Brownsville, Texas. So you're all the way to the other side of the border uh, with Texas. And then Tijuana is where um, uh, all the Haitians were recently. But I was so fortunate because I went down, it was right before COVID. I was going to film Char uh, Charlene de Cruz whose meeting with uh, Amnesty International was canceled because of COVID. And I said, I'm going anyway. And I ran into an attorney named Mulu Amalewu, Amalehu. And she, let, she was so excited that we were there to film her to get the word out because she as well felt like there, were, there was no attention being paid to the plight of black migrants and migrants from Africa, Haitian migrants. So this film shows me going back with her just recently in June and her going back and trying to see what's happening with the border now. If Trump was reelected, I honestly don't think I would have been able to continue this work. I would, I would definitely start winding down, finishing up on my cases that I've already started, and really putting all my energy and effort into finding a different area of work because I think if I was just starting my practice and I was at a younger age, I think I would have been able to maybe uh, persevere through it all. But after so many years of having practiced in such, you know, um, emotionally draining type of work, uh, really humanitarian work is draining. But being having to face an administration that made it much more difficult and was just pure evil. To me, it was pure evil towards immigrants. Do you remember? Do you, remember? Do you came to the service and you never came to the So uh, here we have another one of the abogadas in our film. This is Meritzel Calderon. She's living and she works in Tijuana. She's Mexican and she's a human rights attorney and deals with literally trying to help um, trafficking victims escape cartels. And those trafficking victims, a lot of times are the migrant women that are coming through. So here uh, we were, she basically was briefing us on what's going on in Tijuana at the time. And she's talking to another gentleman here who's actually from Ghana who worked um, on this production with us and um, describing like different aspects that are, that are happening. And then later you're, gonna see, you're going to see scenes when Mulu um, goes into the El Chaparral, which is the area right at the border under a big 
bridge where thousands and thousands of migrants are camped with no services, no organized help from any government, no organized help from any nonprofit. And at the time I was there, not a single porta potty for 2,000 people. Yeah. So they can have the, these benefits in exactly. the space. But I don't know if they have some relation with uh -huh. organized crime. That's because some of them don't want to go there. Oh. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I never know. She was pregnant two months. Mm -hmm. They went to a doctor. The doctor gave them some pill that it was wrong medication. That's the reason why she was a baby. Uh, he wants to know that you yeah. can make a note of that so you can remember. Okay. Maybe it's something they can do because they yeah. didn't want abortion. Okay. So that's the reason. I, I will remember. I will remember. I just, I just want to make sure their num their phone number is correct. So the desperation that I saw has been disheartening. I don't, I don't even know where to go or what to do about it. And it's the most um, disheartening feeling that I've had. Where I was so happy seeing the change of administration, and I thought I was going to come and see much better humanitarian situation at the border, but uh, I didn't see that. I, I actually found it um, to be a situation that seems even worse. Yeah, I think Rebecca and I can both understand that, that exhaustion and almost despair um, that someone like that feels. And even having devoted her, her career um, to this fight, I mean, I've been practicing immigration law for nearly 30 years, and a lot of the job is to advocate for policy changes since whether the White House or Congress is in Republican hands or Democratic hands, immigration is always a lightning rod. Um, it's not always known that what, the last time we had any kind of comprehensive immigration reform was actually under Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and the last time we had any kind of sweeping changes that really made immigration much tougher was under Bill Clinton, at least before Trump, that is. Um, so while immigration advocates breathed a sigh of relief when Trump was defeated, um, Rebecca, I wonder, as she was saying in the clip there, do you think things have really changed under the Biden administration? Um, they've changed in so far as the past administration, um, every day it felt like, well, the past administration knocked everyone to the ground, all the immigrants to the ground, and they were kicking us in the head every single day. And the Biden administration has stopped kicking us in the head every single day. Um, and that's pretty much the only change that I, that I see because a lot of the um, really horrible and cruel policies that Trump enacted have continued under Biden. And that's been a really huge disappointment for, for all of us. Um, in fact, the, you know, he came in and he was going to stop one of the really horrible policies called the Migrant Protection Protocols, which we can talk about in greater detail. But, you know, the sum of it was it's, it's a really bad policy um, and Biden tried to stop it. And the Supreme Court um, has the packed Supreme Court has um, pretty much stopped him from stopping it. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're still being held to the ground, um, just not kicked in a new way every day. It kind of boggles the mind that a policy is not a statute, it's not a regulation, it's a policy um, that the courts can force the administration to keep in place, even though he'd already withdrawn it. Um, that's the, the program that's colloquially known as the Remain in Mexico program, where people that were coming to the border and seeking asylum were told, okay, you can apply, but you have to stay in Mexico until you're hearing, which might be weeks or months or years from now. And that's why you have all those scenes, Vicky and Laura, that you filmed of people in tent camps on the streets of Tijuana and Matamoros. Um, Rebecca, I've heard you call it the migrant persecution protocols. Uh, the, calling it migrant protection protocols is such an Orwellian use of language. It really is. Yeah. The, I mean, just everything that Trump did was was Orwellian, you know, like look at look at this, I'm going to do this and call it one thing when in fact, it's the ab absolute opposite. Um, you know, another thing that he did that Biden still has not undone, which um, was it invoke um, a, a very obscure public health policy or public health rule called Title 42. And um, 
what that did is basically shut down the border to anybody um, under the pretext of public health, you know, the, the COVID pandemic, um, saying that migrants, you know, un, un justifiably blaming the pandemic on migrants and therefore closing the border and not allowing any asylum seekers to, to enter the U.S. to seek protection. And again, that's a policy that could easily be undone. And it was a, a Steve Bannon idea that Trump gleefully latched onto. And it's still, you know, 10 months into Biden's administration, we're still here. And it's absolutely not protecting the U.S. from any sort of, you know, health, health, it's not providing any health protections. And there are many things that the U.S. government could do to actually limit the spread of COVID and asylum seekers are not spreading COVID. So. No, it was a convenient way to shut the border, which is what the former administration wanted to do anyway. Absolutely. And we have a history in this country of demonizing immigrants as bringing being bearers of disease, calling them hordes and using language like that, right? I was gonna move on to asking Laura about how we're going to use the film uh, as a part of a, a social impact strategy. Yeah, sure. I can talk a little bit about that. So I wanna give you guys a little bit of background. Vicki and I have been producing films for about 20 years. Um, and really what documentary filmmakers often do is you go in, you document the story, and then you leave. You leave and then you feel this, you know, you really feel, you know, you still stay and live with this in the edit room, but you, what we are really trying to strategize, what we've been doing with what I did with my last film and what I want to do with this film is really figure out a way to use the film that we produce and even the ancillary materials that accompany the film, whether it be our blogging, events like this to educate, um, educational modules to inspire empathy for refugees. And we want to help make change happen on the larger scale, as well as for the individuals that were in the film. So uh, we have this amazing team, as you, you've met a few, a few of us tonight, but you know, amazing people who I mean, I'm really grateful to be a part of this team because, you know, we are trying to develop strategies to use this film um, to make a difference and make change happen. And I also want to tell you guys that you're part of the team as well. I really, I know it sounds hokey, but it's true. I mean, you can also use the film to help promote the causes that you believe in, whether you are a volunteer with your church or your mosque or your synagogue, or whether you're a lawyer or whether you're working for a refugee, you know, with refugees today. And, um, you know, we're hoping to inspire people to get involved in law in the future as well. Or maybe people to think to, think to you know, they want to become come, um, ad advocates. So we've been working on this film for two years and it takes a long time to make a meaningful documentary. And, we not only go and film and follow and see how the stories unfold and be so sensitive with the subject matters that we follow and be mindful of their, of shining, giving the right, giving not just the right light to them, but also respecting their, their privacy and, um, and tell, telling the right stories. We also um, want to, give you the opportunity to help spread this important message. So um, we really can't do it without your help. And that's what, what one, one thing I do as, an, as, as our impact producers, I help us fund, raise money and get people involved. And so I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna put a donation link here for you to, if, you, if you're interested in donating to the film. And um, please feel free to use the film and our materials and continue to join us at these events to help move the, our cause forward and even help us develop the cause as it evolves. Because that's the beauty also of a documentary is it's constantly evolving the storyline. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for coming. And I think uh, we may have um, questions. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to open it up to Q&A. Please put your questions in the chat. I saw a couple coming in, but I want to 
take some executive privilege here and ask the first question because watching these clips, I wonder, have any of you ever felt in danger when you've been on the ground filming these scenes? Well, um, I'll start, I'll start with that. Um, I, Matamoros is, I think it's, you know, on the red level and the don't, 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 don't ever go level on the State Department for travel. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the towns on the border that's really run by cartels, which is very sad. Um, so this is where, you know, this migrant camp ended up. And this is why it was so dangerous for the migrants. You know, children were being kidnapped right out of the camp. Um, so it's, it's a dangerous area. Uh, I was warned by Rebecca and Charlene DeCruz. Char Charlene DeCruz is full-time with Lawyers for Good Government, another wonderful organization. And she has part of that organization, her funding goes to Project Corazon, which means Project Heart. And she is, you know, almost, you know, just a one woman machine to get people across the border when no one else could. And I take what Charlene says very seriously. And she said, this is very dangerous. We have to get out of here by dusk. And we would, um, you know, that being said in that camp in Matamoros, you kind of got a family feel during the day. You know, they, there are kids and there were ice cream trucks and there were, you know, people making the best out of a horrible situation. So that is a dangerous area. I did feel a lot more danger in Tijuana where there was no sort of uh, system. There, there was no one guarding and what the danger was felt by, you know, cartels and kidnappers. And as soon as it started getting dark, people would come in like this and literally the tents were like this together because trucks would come in and literally pull people out of the camp. It was very, very scary. So yes, there are times that it's, that it's terrifying and sometimes you feel a little bit um, not afraid because you have a camera, which you shouldn't be. So you try to surround yourself by a good crew who's watching out for you because you're watching the scene. Wow. We have a, a question in the chat. Uh, with the circumstances changing almost every day, how do you decide what to include or what not to include? And will the recent Haitian influx be covered in the film? I wanted to be from Trump to Trump because that just gave me a nice little window. And of course, nothing, no nice little windows ever happen when you're documentary filmmaking. So um, COVID happened. I, and I'm not the, this happened to every documentary filmmaker who was making a film in 2020. I'm on the ground and I'm getting all this great scenes and I have all these great characters and all of a sudden, uh, you know, this wall of COVID came down. Fortunately for me, Rebecca was recording things uh, herself. Mulu was, um, uh, Jody Goodwin's, you know, the, the kids, I would try to have their kids record their moms as they're in lockdown. So um, you just, you don't know what to include. The Haitian migrants, absolutely. I was down there and I met many, many Haitians. And those same group are the ones that moved over to Mexico and came across the border. And a lot of them have been deported now. Some were beaten, some um, just, you know, their stories are all over the place. But yeah, we, we did a lot of filming of the Haitian migrants when they were in Tijuana. So we'll definitely follow that story. Great. So I'm going to read some questions from the chat, but we're also allowing you to unmute yourself. So if you want to ask it live, please feel free. A question from the chat, uh, two questions. Do you have a projected completion date? And what and where will your viewing venue be? <laughs> <laughs> so um, projected completion date would be fall about around this time next year. Um, and when documentary filmmakers, usually we roll out um, our film in festivals because you want to create a buzz and you want to get people talking about it. So you typically pick like what's the next big festival. Everybody tries for Sundance and South by Southwest, IDFA, which is the International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam, Cannes. Um, but then there's a million more festivals and every time it's in front of people, uh, we'll be talking and Laura will be doing her impact producer work and Rebecca will be on a panel and Kareen can come and it's just like everywhere we can show it. Capitol Hill is one of the main places we want to show it. This is, this is a film that we really need to use to promote better policy, in my opinion. A uh, follow up question to that that came to me directly. It seems that immigration policy has barely changed with the new administration, thanks in part to the Supreme Court. What can people do to help change immigration policy? 
And Vicki, you can answer that. Or Rebecca is the lawyer on the panel. You can jump in if you want. Huh. Actually, I was going to throw that question back to you, Corrine. <laughs> there's there's a lot of immigration lawyers on, on this uh, in the in the. Uh, uh, Zoom today. So any any advice, any suggestions? You know, I I feel like you know the the standard refrain. You know, contact your elected representatives. Tell them that this is not what you want. Um, I became very discouraged under the last administration as to what kind of weight my voice actually carried in the government. Um, but you know, what's the alternative? Not saying anything. I don't think we can do that. So you know, just keep calling keep pressing for change and um, pay attention to elections, pay attention to school board elections, local elections, because it all starts from there. And it builds its way up to, you know, who we get with the Supreme Court. Absolutely, a comment in the chat is advocacy. And I honestly think um, part of why I wanted to be part of this film is that I think education is part of advocacy. I think letting people know what's really happening and being part of the conversation, pushing back against the myths when your friends and your family say stuff around the dinner table at Thanksgiving, when they post things on Facebook that you know are wrong, when there are myths and they're lies, when there are Fox News, um, you know, out, propaganda about, for example, the horrors of migrants bringing COVID in over the border. I'm convinced that more American tourists brought COVID over the border in the other direction uh, than vice versa. Um, I think educating people about the real impact of US immigration policy on asylum seekers. I mean, one of my own pet peeves is when people say, you know, they should come in the right way, they should follow the rules. Well, if you are fleeing danger and you're seeking asylum, the right way, the rule of law way to do it is to present yourself at an international border and say, I am seeking protection from harm. That's what you do. That's what these people are doing. And we are not following domestic and international law when we push them back. People don't know that. So films like this, I hope, will be part of the conversation, part of the educational process of letting people know this is the right way. And we want as a country to stand for the humanitarian way of letting people seek refuge from harm. Absolutely, Corrine. I, I agree 100%. And in fact, it's it's even more infuriating. My family, my dad was born in a refugee camp in post-World War II Germany, and his siblings lived in this refugee camp and came to the U.S. on a ship. And they say, well, you know, we came the right way. And it, it's so wrong. It's They're so wrong. And, you know, yeah, advocacy and pushing back and fighting for our voting rights and, and fighting against all of the infringements on, on our rights that, you know, successive administrations are doing under different, you know, for different reasons. Um, but all of that stuff is really important. Yeah, voting rights, as somebody else has said in the chat, is very important. If our votes count less and less, then our voice counts less as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a mm -hmm. comment from a fake Laura Seltzer, do not. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know who really said this. Uh, I've been to the border three times to volunteer, twice during the DJT administration, once this past April under Biden Harris. No matter who I speak to on return, I tell them, yes, um, I tell them what I've witnessed and how our country is treating the weakest people on the planet. I witness, I cannot change every mind, but I try to change some hearts. Absolutely. I think um, that's that's wonderful. I'm sorry, Karina, but the um, Witness on the Border is a Facebook page run by Josh Rubin. It's an organization. Um, if you're interested, uh, probably a lot of you follow him already. Um, witnessing is so important. It really is. And, uh, you know, all of us can do that. All of us can, you know, take some witnessing of, of this travesty of injustice and humanitarian, you know, just it's a night it's a humanitarian nightmare i was absolutely devastated coming back from tijuana it was like nothing i'd ever seen um so we have to do better as a country we have to change the narrative this is illegal we need to take care of the people that are coming to us for help and i love charlene de cruz's quote at the end of the film where at the end of the the trailer and she says it's a human right you know this is humans have always migrated and, you know, there's, there's no reason to end it. So just do it in a humanitarian way. Exactly. 
I love this comment in the chat. <laughs> Consider connecting the holiday times with fundraising for films like this <laughs> and legal services and other things that are important to you. Hi, I'm Carmen Bella and I live in Texas um, <clears throat> near um, Dilly and I mean, in that area where all the detention centers were before, but um, I want to comment that here in Texas, of course, our governor is, you know, um, he's horrible and, and he keeps demonizing uh, immigrants, uh, asylum seekers, and the, it's difficult here because, you know, the sheriffs, two of the sheriffs in my area are openly anti-immigrant. And you know, just blaming everything on them and convincing people here in my neighborhood and this area that there's hordes of them coming and that they, you know, wanna they, they, that they're horrible and wanna do evil things to us. And it's just it's really difficult than you know, just trying to get to people because even a lot of the Latinos in their area yeah. believe all this stuff, you know. And <laughs> And um, it's it's just hard. Yeah, I've been to Dilly several times as a volunteer in the detention center, and it was always really kind of heartbreaking when the local Latino population would um, not be very happy when they learned why we were in town. <laughs> and of course, it was a source of jobs too. So I mean, there's that tension too. The detention centers provide jobs in communities where there aren't any. Um, I see another really interesting question in the chat. I don't have an answer, but it's curious if you have a sense of how many immigrants are escaping climate related disasters. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't have any figures, but I know that climate change is a, a huge driver of migration. Rebecca, do you have a comment on that? I don't have a, a, a you know an accurate number, but I remember during the caravan, there was lots of press following the caravans and all the people. And one crew was from the Weather Channel. And I was like, what, what are you doing? You know, are you, um, you know, going to frame this as a tsunami of humanity? Like, I, I really wasn't sure what their point was. And they actually pointed it out to me that many of the people were, in fact, fleeing the ravages of climate change, the lack, you know, the failure of crops, um, hurricane, hurricanes, mudslides, flooding, all of those things. And they really have, it really is definitely, um, an effect uh, that's that's a factor um, that's propelling people to leave. Um, there's people you know, when the last time I was at the at the Abba shelter, a lot of people, the majority, every single person I talked to was from Honduras and the vast majority of them were saying that they were leaving because there was no work or there was no food. Um, and many of them had been, you know, um, subsistence farmers or they had lost their homes in recent hurricanes or flooding. So I think there is definitely going to be more and more people um, migrating as a result of climate change. I have a couple stats that I was thinking, I was looking at this before we started. I'm just going to roll out to you guys. Shockingly, 82.4, over 82.4 million people have been forcibly di displaced worldwide. Uh, 48 million internally displaced, 20, over 48 over 26 million are refugees and uh, 4.1 million are asylum seekers. And the last is um, 30, uh, well, I, I think those are good good three, three numbers to just think about. It's a massive mm -hmm. undertaking, a massive, you know, um, that this is, these are numbers from the UN uh, United Nations Refugee Agency. Wow. And speaking of numbers, there's a final question I think we have time for from the chat. Would you address the issue of numbers? We always hear incredibly large numbers, truly overwhelming, a seemingly impossible task to manage. Is this part of the myth of immigration? Is it real? If so, where are the answers in terms of processing? Um, and I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I, I heard large numbers um, in terms of the numbers of people that are being apprehended at the US-Mexico border. And I know for a fact that those numbers are inflated in a lot of different ways. For one thing, they count every apprehension, which is not necessarily every person. And when you've created a situation where, as somebody said in the chat earlier, Title 42 is Biden's wall. Um, it was Trump's wall as well. Um, when you've created a virtual wall that has kept people masked on the far side of the US border, um, and they sometimes feel like they have no choice but to try to come across. And most of the times they're caught and sent back. They're gonna keep trying to come across until they make it through. 
So they might be caught five or 10 times. And so that means the numbers that you see in the newspaper or on the news are gonna be five or 10 times the actual numbers of people that are there. So I, I would take any numbers that you read about in the news, even you know, news sources that we think are trustworthy, I would take them all with a grain of salt. I'd, li I'd also like to say just from you know my experience, my last book was actually about um, Sicilian and Italian migrants who the Sicilians made a bad name for themselves in this country because they became the mafia, the first the black hand and the mafia They came in to New Orleans. But during that period, there were 4 million, um, something enormous amount of migration from Italy, right? And a lot of backlash against the Italians at the time. And so like Charlene says again, this has always been happening, right? And so the amounts are enormous, but I think it's political that puts it, that makes it difficult, right? Even, even if you have climate change, if you have a wealthy country that's politically stable, you can handle a hurricane, right? You can handle it. If you have corrupt governments that have taken all the funding and you have gangs in Honduras, these people are leaving because if they don't have $5 to pay the mafia, they get killed. You know, so it's, it's like, we can handle this with compassionate governments and, it's, it sounds astronomical because you say these numbers, but this has always been, you know, migration has always been, we can handle it. And we do, and we have over the course of history. So let's continue to do it just in the, and be our best in this country, which is, you know, all we can do. Everybody can make a difference. And that's the thing I think we need to remember, like every individual in our own way can make a difference. Otherwise we get overwhelmed. Thank you, everyone. I really wish we could keep talking, but we're about to run out of time. There are a lot of other interesting comments and questions in the chat, um, but I'm going to have to stop us here, unfortunately. Uh, but this is just the first of many events that we're going to be hosting. So if you are here today, it means you're on our mailing list and you'll hear about future events that we will look forward to holding. Uh, this event was to give you an inside look about making the film. Um, but it's not just about making a film for any of us. This is a nonprofit venture. As I mentioned, we have an educational purpose. It's about advocacy. It's about education. It's about making a difference. Um, you know, I talked about how one of my own pet peeves is about when people say you got to come the right way. We hope that this film will help show what is actually happening to people who are trying to do it the right way, who are seeking nothing more than safety for themselves and their families. We hope you'll spread the word, help us celebrate the lawyers who are making a difference at the border. Uh, we will post a video of today's event um, at our blog link uh, on our website later this week. Our blog, uh, our website is lasabogadosfilm.com. Look also for announcements of future events and know that your tax deductible donations will help us finish this important film. And remember that we have a generous donor, Judith Jill. Thank you, Judith, so much, matching all of our donations today. Thank you, Vicki, Laura, and Rebecca for being here tonight. And thank you for all that you do. Thanks to everyone for coming tonight and thank you for your support.